What's up, y'all? My name is JR, and for those of you who don't already know, I'm a huge movie and TV nerd. If you're new here, I appreciate you taking the time to check out my channel. I hope you'll consider sticking around and joining the film community I'm trying to build here on YouTube. So in today's video, I'm going to be breaking down the first episode in season three of the Paramount hit TV show, Mayor of Kingstown. And just so you guys know, this video will contain spoilers, so if you haven't gotten around to watching the episode yet, and you don't want to know anything that happens in it, you might want to exit this video now. And with that being said, no more wasting time, let's get into it. So, the first episode of season three starts off a lot like the very first episode of the series with a Mike McCluskey voiceover about good and evil and their place in the world as we get a look at Kingstown in winter with the snow falling down. And, you know, I think this is the writers trying to kind of set the stage for the story to get even darker and uh, colder than it already has. Um, I think they're preparing us for the question that this season will ask us, which I think is, you know, what's the difference between a good person and a bad one? And, which of our characters fall on which side of that fence? And, you know, as we hear Mike tell us about how his deceased big brother Mitch um, defined this very thing, you know, we get a montage and I want to take a minute to point out a few things that are noticeable during the shots that we see. You know, first we see that Kyle's wife is still there with him. So she did indeed come back just like she said she would when she heard about Miriam and uh, she stayed. And next we see that Bunny is still on his rooftop looking out over the city on his on his king shit, you know. Um, next, after that, we see that Robert survived the attempt on his life by Bunny's crew and that he has somewhat recovered from his wounds, though he still has a black eye and his arm in a sling. Uh, and finally, we see Evelyn who has been promoted from assistant DA to DA DA um, after the murder of <laughs> DA Lockett last season, um, showing up to Miriam McCluskey's funeral with a uh, security detail in tow. Now, you might remember that Miriam was shot accidentally by Kyle's bullets, mind you, uh, during the shootout between the McCluskey brothers and Milo's men at um, Miriam's house in the season two finale. And, you know, I remember hearing late last year um, or reading rather online that Diane Weist would not be returning for season three. So I was fully prepared to not see her in this upcoming season. And so, you know, the writers just had the perfect opportunity to move on into the new season without her by just doing away with her off screen. Um, but in the season three premiere, you know, her funeral happens you know, with everyone there. Everyone who's everyone, that is. And then, you know, after it's done, as people begin to disperse, a bomb goes off out of nowhere, planted in a trash can near the family's hearse, which leads me to believe, at least, that it was a hit intended for Mike, or at the very least, a close affiliate. Um, so here we get the catalyst for the episode, and we're off. So in the immediate aftermath of the explosion, you know, Mike and the boys get together and try to determine who the culprits might be. And my man Ian immediately says, you know, he wants to go scorch earth and essentially come for everybody, you know, meaning all the gangs. Um, but Mike preaches patience uh, before he tells the guys to give him an hour while he tries to find out, you know, who is actually responsible. Now, this is where I think we all as the audience need to keep our heads on the swivel and look out for what I like to call writer's sleight of hand. Now, remember back in episode eight of season two, I believe, um, the Aryans are after Mike. And one of them chases him down in a car, you know, while he's on foot and tries to end him. Now, I happen to think the writers are trying to be slick here because at the end of episode eight, Milo shows up out of the blue. So it might be easy to think that the man in the car was one of the Russians. But remember, Allison, the widow Mike met at the bar and slept with the night before. Well, you know, before Mike left her house the next morning, she was on the phone with someone 
telling them that Mike was at her place. Um, but unless you go and actually look up Terry Belleville, um, you would have no idea who he is other than the fact that he was a guard who was killed in the prison riots in the first season, you know, because Allison tells us so in the bar scene with Mike, but we never see him or so we think he could very well be the very first guard that was done away with, um, by the masked gentleman, uh, before Mike ever walked into the prison at the end of season one. But, you know, nevertheless, let's just go with, we never saw him. Um, but, What Allison doesn't say is that Terry was affiliated with the Aryans. And so without that information, you know, you would have no reason to suspect the Aryans over Milo's guys. But that's who that was. That was one of the one of the Aryans that was looking for Mike. I bring all that up because I think the show has created um, an opportunity for the writers to perform one giant misdirect here. If you think about it, there could be two different factions that could potentially want Mike dead at this point. You know, the Aryans are the obvious ones. I mean, you know, as they tried, you know, and failed to get at Mike multiple times before season two ended. Um, But there's also the Russians who you might remember wanted to end Mike before they all ended up, you know, deleted on the dock in season two finale, um, including Milo, though we never actually see a body. And, you know, the streets need a body. Um, But, you know, personally, I think the explosion was the work of the Russians. And I'll get more into why I think that in just a minute. But I've seen many people talk about the cryptic phone call made to Tatiana at the end of the season two finale, stating that as proof that Milo somehow survived the explosion on the boat. I don't think that's the case. And as for the phone call, I have an alternate explanation for that. It wasn't Milo. Consider just for a moment that there are probably other Russians out there besides Milo somewhere um, in this Russian gang of his and put a pin in that for just a second. So back to the episode, Mike goes to Bunny under the guise of trying to get intel about the explosion that happened at the funeral. But I think this was ultimately a ruse to try to convince Bunny to give up the guns he stole last season so that he could appease his law enforcement buddies and get them off Bunny's ass. And I got to say, he and Mike seem pretty chummy at this point, Um, even though he went ahead and pressed the button on Big Rob. Um, But I guess Mike forgave him for that since Rob survived the attack. And, you know, as the pair talk, we can actually see the tanks and other law enforcement vehicles rolling through the streets of Kingstown down below. So it looks like that war that Bunny was declaring on law enforcement could be on and crackulating sooner rather than later. But I mean, you know, we'll, we'll see how that all unfolds as the season moves on. Um, you know, but Mike does get around to eventually asking Bunny, you know, in a roundabout way, if he tried to blow him up and Bunny denies it. And that seems good enough for Mike, at least for now. And, you know, from there, Mike meets up again with his frat bros at a diner someplace. And and to their surprise, Big Rob shows up, um, black eyes and all, (laughs) apparently ready to go back to work. You know, Kyle tells everyone that Bunny is going to give up the guns he stole. I mean, information that he obviously got from Mike. Um, And the group seems really unimpressed by all this. But Mike goes on to tell them that Bunny isn't the one who tried to blow them up. And he also tells Rob that Bunny wasn't the one who put the hit out on him. And I got to say, this line of dialogue is interesting because Bunny has never denied coming for Big Rob last season when Mike asked him about it. So as far as the writers would have us believe, at least at this point, Bunny absolutely put the hit out on Big Rob. So why would Mike tell Rob otherwise? The only guess I can muster is to stop the war between, you know, Kingstown Police Department and the Crips. But it could also be to protect Bunny specifically from police retaliation for the hit. And I guess we'll find out as we move forward. Anyway, so, you know, Mike tells everybody that he believes it was the Aryans who tried to blow them up, which they all buy because of everything that happened toward the end of the last season. 
But the big news during this conversation is that Gunner apparently survived the attack by the All Blacks late last season, which is a big deal in this part of the story because it gives the writers another pretty powerful piece that can be moved around the board this season, even if it's only used to get in Mike's way occasionally. Now, after that, you know, Mike takes all the boys on a field trip where he <laughs> he borrows some brass knuckles from Ian and he walks up on a meth dealer who he punches in the back of the head and then tortures before he ultimately shoots him in the foot um, while he's trying to get the address for his supplier. Um, and, you know, Mike is for, for somebody who's trying to stop the violence. Mike seems to be going scorched earth this season. Um, straight out the gate. But, you know, I digress. Um, after that, we see Tatiana, who is still working and living at the Russian club. Now, she gets a visit from a new guy. And this guy, I think, is going to be extremely important this season. His name is Constantine. And he is a different Russian mobster. And like I was telling you guys, I think there are more Russians. And this is who I think Tatiana was talking to on the phone last season, um, where, you know, he's saying that everything went well. Because I personally think she gave Milo up to this guy. And, you know, based on their conversation, Constantine is looking to clean house and start fresh. You feel me? <laughs> and, you know, like I said, this is the guy I think is also responsible for the bomb that went off at Miriam's funeral. Now, why do I think that? Because bombs appear to be this dude's M.O. He used explosive device to, to end Milo last season uh, again, I think Milo is actually dead. And I've never known the Aryans to deal in explosives. They seem to be the simple firearm kind of guys, from what I can tell. But I think Constantine maybe sees Mike as a problem for whatever his new plans might be in Kingstown. And, you know, I guess, you know, we'll have to keep watching to find out. But on the way to the office, Mike calls Kareem. <laughs> but Kareem is not here for any of Mike's bull crap at this point. Uh, and I guess this is just Kareem keeping his promise, you know, to stay out of Mike's affairs as mayor and simply go to work and be the warden and come home. And I mean, we'll see how long that lasts. I mean, I mean, you know, these things probably won't, won't last very long because they never do in shows like this. So I doubt Kareem is able to stay out of the fray for any extended period of time. But Mike next shows up at his office and Rebecca tells Mike that she closed the office for the day because of the funeral and that Mike should go home. And a few moments later, Mike gets a call from Bunny about the guns. And, you know, Mike tells Bunny that KPD is going to press the Aryans so he should tell Raphael, his cousin, um, the one who he left in prison when he got out, to be on the lookout for retribution of some kind. And Bunny doesn't seem worried, which means he will absolutely have something to worry about in that regard very soon. Um, that's, again, that's just kind of how these things go. Um, in the next scene, we see Tracy and Iris packing up Miriam's things as Tracy remembers her and, you know, what she meant to her. Uh, and Iris looks like she's finally starting to adjust to civilian life, but I think she's going to be a problem in the future, if you ask me. I'm fully prepared at some point to see her backslide and, and cause more drama in the lives of the McCluskeys. I don't know. Just, just call it a feeling. And then next, Mike calls Ian to let him know that Bunny has indeed left the guns to be picked up. And Ian, still unimpressed by the gesture, is surveilling the address that Mike got from the meth dealer with KPD, and it turns out it's a pretty fortified compound, and Ian seems concerned about how they will approach breaching the location. Um, and despite that, he tells Mike that he's ready to go, but that Big Rob needs to be in bed um, someplace healing. And um, Ian tells Mike that Rob is his eyes, and so he wants him to stay. And Mike seems nervous about that. Now, Mike arrives at Miriam's house, the McCluskey house, and um, talks to Iris about making sure that Tracy's okay. And Iris asks Mike how he's doing. Mike tells Kyle about the raid, and he insists on taking part, making note that he's officially a cop again, so there's that. 
And, you know, Mike tells Kyle not to be a hero and to stay out of the fray, you know, for the sake of his wife and his unborn baby. And after some begging and pleading, Kyle reluctantly agrees. Now, the raid happens in the next scene. And um, so we finally get a little bit of bang, bang that this show is known for, you know, past the explosion at the beginning. And, you know, Ian, Kyle and, and Big Rob watch from the safety of the SWAT van as the shooting all starts. But you know Big Rob, he just can't sit still. So he leaves the van and gets a vest and a grenade launcher, I believe. And he does go full on Big Rob, blowing up the building and presumably doing away with everyone inside. (laughs) So, So the next morning, Mike gets a call, shows up at the location, and he doesn't look happy to find six people dead, especially when he hears that Big Rob did another Big Rob thing. And... Mike already knows that when Evelyn hears about what's happening, she's going to lose her, her, her shit. Uh, from there, we go to Millwood Correctional Facility. And I assume this is a new jail we haven't seen before because they actually felt the need to actually um, superimpose Millwood Correctional Facility um, on the shot. And this is where we get to meet Merle Callahan, an Aryan shot caller who is talking to a young man about turning down a deal he's been offered um, because it's his duty and that, you know, if you, if you take a deal, you'll never be able to, you know, live without looking over your shoulder for the rest of your life kind of situation. So it's kind of like a thinly veiled threat, but he's really calm about it, which is kind of, you know, makes him a little scary, but, um, he gets new news about the raid. And of course he's pissed and he kicks everyone out of his cell. And so from there we see Mike call Carney and he lets him know that about the KPD raid gone wrong, warning that it could come back on him uh, or someone over at Anchor Bay, and he needs to get Kareem to answer his calls. And right after that, in the same scene, in fact, Evelyn calls about the raid and asks Mike to meet her. Then we see back at the McCluskey house, Iris is going through the medicine cabinet, and she steals pills, um before Tracy's water ultimately breaks down in the kitchen and Iris has to get her to the hospital. So like I said, again, I think that Iris is going to, I don't think she's done breaking down yet, even though she does look like she's doing better at this point, but I don't think she's done breaking down. So, you know, Evelyn meets with Mike and she complains about Rob and what he's done. And she tells Mike that she's coming after all the corrupt cops in the KPD And she insists that if Mike's name comes up during her investigation, that she has no problem rolling him up, too. Um, I guess, you know, she ain't getting that good old loving from a man no more. She say, hey, you can get it, too. Um, Anybody can get it. But, you know, Mike seems to kind of be more interested in being flirty and playful. Um, But he does chastise her about ditching her security detail. Um, You know, but, I, you know, she claims that she does it because she's reached a point where she doesn't trust the local PD to protect her. And. I guess I understand with everything that has happened to this point, I can understand why she doesn't want local PD protecting her. And the conversation ends with Mike getting a call from Iris about Tracy and he leaves. Meanwhile, Ian and Stevie find the guns um, in an all white part of town, (laughs) just sitting outside with the back, the back of the van just wide open with a bunch of kids playing around outside. And in fact, they catch a couple of kids trying to walk off with, with some of the weapons um, and, and they don't seem to appreciate that very much. They're like, you know, Bunny play too much, right? Now, back at the club, Tatiana calls Constantine, but when he sees that it's her, he essentially deactivates his phone, which seems to worry her, and I think she should be worried, because that's, I mean, you know, if you're calling somebody that you've been in contact with about criminal things that are kind of going on, and all of a sudden, you know, the number you've reached is no longer in service... <laughs> That means you might not be long for this world. Um, Or at the very least, that person don't trust you no more and you need to be watching your back. Now, at the prison, um, one-eyed blood buddy, (laughs) um, I think his name is Dietrich, um, he gets shanked on the yard while taking a whiz. That is is the wildest scene. I mean, they, you know, but hey. So apparently this is the reprise for um, the Crips, you know, um, snitching and kind of making things hard for the Aryans. Um, And, you know, I mean, you know, if if Gunner survived, it could also be reprised simply for that. Um, But 
there's a young black prison guard who attempts to come to um, Dietrich's aid alone um, inside the fence before backup can arrive. But I mean, it's too late. So, you know, R.I.P. Dietrich or Blood Buddy, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you <laughs> you did your thing right now. Mike shows up back at the house, the McCluskey house. And so does Kyle looking for an overnight bag he left behind. Now, Mike calm, has to calm Kyle down and he sends him back to the hospital saying, hey, look, we'll find the bag. When we find the bag, you know, we'll get it to you. Just go back and be with your wife. Now, before Kyle leave, he asks what's up with Mike and Iris. And I'm just going to keep it a stack. I think that's something we all want to know. Part of what I think isn't working with this show is that the writers can't seem to make up their mind about what exactly to do with Iris. You know, I felt like they missed an opportunity to get her out of Kingstown. You know, um, back in the day, uh, well, back in the beginning of season two, excuse me. And so now I guess we'll have to see what happens moving forward um, with that whole situation. Put a pin in that. (laughs) Um, Now, Mike hears about the hit by the Aryans at the prison and he he doesn't really seem impressed, expecting that they would have tried to hit someone bigger. Um, like Bunny's cousin, who Mike learns has moved himself back to Gen Pop. And I think this move was made in order to set up a much bigger move. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Now, Mike leaves and tells Iris to call him if anything goes down with Tracy. Meanwhile, Tatiana, (laughs) poor girl, attempts to leave the club with her baby. But Constantine shows up outside the club in an alley and he stops her. And this is where we find out um, something that we probably kind of knew already and that uh, Tatiana gave up Milo late last season, um, which is what is meant at the end of the season when Mike showed up and he came looking for Milo at the club along with Iris. And he told Tatiana to get out of Kingstown. And she told Mike that she had friends that, and she could take care of herself. herself. Anyway, Constantine, you know, does away with her in the alley outside the club and he takes the baby. I'm scared for that kid. Boy, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you know how like, a lot of these gangsters and stuff like that won't hurt children. But still, that's that's I'm a little concerned. And so much for friendship, you know, but um, and, and I got to say, I hate when these kinds of things happen in TV shows in that I don't like to see people die at the beginning of a season that were around for previous seasons. Um. Uh, because I just think the writers could have just offed her last season in the season two finale if, if, if they were going to do this. It, it would have been cleaner if you ask me. And I know Dietrich or AKA Blood Pirate, you know, you know, he just got got this episode, too. But I feel like that was done for a reason that pushes the narrative forward. Um, that was done for a reason that will resonate for the rest of the season. And here. I think this was just doing away with the character that you were clearly done with at the end of last season. But, uh, you know, that's just me. So, you know, next we get Mike and his bestie, Bunny, (laughs) sitting in an old factory building drinking beers together, discussing the hit on Blood Pirate. Um, Now, Bunny thinks the hit was in lieu of confronting Raphael and by association, him personally. You know, um, which, again, I think is a little short sighted, you know, but whatever. You know, uh, I think at this point, Bunny thinks he's kind of untouchable. And I I think that's going to come back to bite him at some point. I wouldn't be surprised if Raphael ain't long for this world either. And that at some point during this season, he might get got. Um, Now, Mike playfully calls Bunny out for where he left the guns. (laughs) But, you know, Bunny explains that he had to drop them someplace where there weren't tanks rolling up and down the street. And the pair have a laugh. Now, next, we see Kareem outside of the Anchor Bay prison talking to um, the new guard, the young black man, who we find out has had family that has been incarcerated before, which I think might be why he came to the aid of Blood Pirate when he got stabbed in the yard. And I we keep an eye on this young man because I get the feeling that or when I saw this scene, I got I immediately got the feeling that he might be at the prison working as a guard for reasons we don't yet know, um, because I always try to pay close attention to exactly what a character says and how they say it, especially towards the beginning of a season. You know, when seeds are being planted that will 
no lot, you know, that will bear fruit later on in the season. So back to Mike and Bunny and their conversation. Bunny talks to Mike about how his stay in prison was good for him and how it gave him time to see the bigger picture, a picture that may even involve him leaving Kingstown altogether. But it didn't sound like a picture that involved him leaving the Crips game. It sounds to me like he's got designs on not just running the Crips in Kingstown, but running the Crips on a much larger scale. And, you know, Mike is skeptical, of course. And Bunny tells Mike, you know, that he has ambitions. So this is what I'm talking about. And Mike reminds him that it's OK to have ambitions, but that he also has to be practical. And this is where Mike reminds him that no matter what he's trying to do, that there's a line. And that he's already like stepped across it. And, you know, he's talking about Big Rob. And Mike tells him that he gave him that one. He's like, you know, you, 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 you kind of trickled your toe across the line. I let you have that one. But, but there's not going to be another one. And Bunny kind of chuckles and says, uh, I hear you, Mayor Mike. And I, I got to say that I really like this character. Um, Bunny reminds me a lot of Alcido from Hightown, but he's much more complex. And, you know, I think the writers did a much better job of crafting his dialogue specifically. And I also think that Toby um, Bam Teffa um, does a much better job of playing him um, uh, than, than the actor who plays Alcido in Hightown. But, uh, you know, that's just my two cents on that. You know, after that, you know, Mike gets the call. I'm assuming from Iris or I suppose it could be from Kyle. And he learns that his new nephew, <laughs> Mitch, is here. And, you know, Bunny congratulates Mike and the pair say their goodbyes. And just then Bunny is handed a phone and we see exactly what I was saying about the young black prison guard. He's on the other end of the line talking to Bunny about what happened to Diedrich, you know, a.k.a. Blood Pirate. Um, which now explains why, again, like I said, why he rushed inside the gate and tried to help. Now, I don't know if the young man is actually a crip or if he's just related to Bunny and maybe Bunny brought him from out of state or something like that to come in and kind of help him do some things. Um, but we're going to see if my man is about it, about it moving forward. Um, I, I tend to lean on the side that he, he's probably at least a little bit about it because he, he wouldn't have been brought here and he wouldn't have agreed if he couldn't kind of hold his own, you know, when when the crap hits the proverbial fan. But um, next, we see Mike back at the McCluskey house, and he's patching up bullet holes in the wall. And him and Iris have a drink and a toast to Miriam and baby Mitch. Now, here's where Iris finally makes a move on Mike. It's, it's, it's about time. You know, somebody, you know, you know, just, either, you know, Crap will get out the pot, you feel me? But, you know, Mike shuts it down pretty quickly, and he tells Iris that she can stay or she can go. And I think this line was just basically him telling her that she didn't have to earn her keep that way, which I appreciated. Because, you know, with her background as an escort, I could understand how it could get in her head that if she wanted to stay, she's going to have to find somebody to satisfy, if you know what I'm saying. And I, I actually like the fact that Mike cares enough about Iris to not kind of take advantage of all the damage, you know, uh, that we see with her. And he kind of took the high road. Um, and, you know, Mike's got bigger fish to fry anyway. So it's it's absolutely believable that this is kind of how that would go down, you know. Um, and I think, you know, Mike sleeping with her after everything would be the, a, a catastrophic mistake. Because, again, like I said, I think Iris is going to continue to be a problem even though she's not right this second. Um, and then lastly, you know, we see my man Merle arrive by bus at what looks like Anchor Bay Prison. Uh, and, you know, they walk him inside, and that's kind of the last scene that we see. And this is going to set the stage, like I said, for what comes next in this uh, back and forth between the Aryans and the, Clip and the Crips. And, you know, I think this is going to be, like I said, the, the, the thing that kind of drives the season along with, you know, whatever Constantine's got cooking up. So, you know, guys, in conclusion, you should keep in mind that um, a season premiere is typically just a placing of various chess pieces on the board, so to speak. And then we spend the rest of the season watching the game unfold, you know, as those pieces kind of find their way across the board to their resting place until 
the next season, you know, assuming there is one, where that process kind of starts all over again. Uh, I say that to say that um, in a season that's expected to have 10 episodes, I wouldn't really expect for shit to get really deep until sometime maybe late in episode three or so. Um, that's not to say that there won't be any violence because, you know, Mayor of Kingstown is known for, you know, for the violence kind of being pervasive. So I certainly expect for more shooting and stuff like that to go down. But as far as the story really kind of getting to the point where it gets really juicy and really good, uh, we probably got another episode or two before we really kind of, before you really kind of become engrossed at what's taking place this season. Um, but I do expect good things from this TV show and this season. Um, even though I thought last season got a little bit muddy, you know, especially, like I said, where Iris and, and Miriam McCluskey were concerned. But now, you know, Miriam is gone. So that's a moot point. And, you know, but I'm really interested to see if the writers are going to finally decide if Iris is staying or going. That's the thing. Um, she's kind of playing double Dutch here in Kingstown. And, and I, I just want her to make a decision or the writers to make her make a decision so that we can kind of, you know, unclog the drain a little bit there. Um, they seem to finally have picked a lane as it pertains to whether or not Mike and Iris are going to be romantic. It looks like they're leaning on that they won't. Um, and I think that will clear up a lot for both Mike and Iris. And um, it'll make moving forward story wise a whole lot less, less messy. But what do you guys think? Did you like the first episode of the new season? What do you hope to get out of this season? Let me know in the comments. And for those of you who might be new to the channel, be sure to like and share this video. If you really like the content, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. That way you'll be notified whenever I drop a new video. Also, be sure to go and check out themadscreenwriter.com for more television and film reviews and info on my upcoming film projects. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I got screenplays to write. I'll catch y'all in the next video.